to be moral, be sentimental rather than rational. Hello, this is Dr. Bing Song at Washington College. In this unit, let's continue to talk about David Hume, not about his、uh, empiricist epistemology, but his so-called moral sentimentalism. As discussed in last unit, Hume can be considered as a rare dissenting voice among modern thinkers, since he thinks it is a custom and a habit which plays the most dominant role in human knowledge about the objective natural world. His general attitude towards natural science, because of his emphasis upon custom and habit, remains modest. Since, according to his theory, all human reasoning about the cause and the effect is based upon what we today call induction, and this implies that all scientific conclusions about causality are by no means certain and fixed once for all. Instead, they always succumb to testing, falsification, and perfection. Which is quite in line what we have discussed about Karl Popper's thought on the distinction between science and pseudoscience. Although Popper's understanding of scientific methodology is somewhat different from Hume, in an era when the reputation of natural science was skyrocketing because of its unprecedented power of accurate prediction. And the technological transformation, we have to admire Hume's modesty and reservation about how limited human knowledge can be. However, in comparison with Hume's ethics, I think the salient nature of Hume's thought in epistemology will even pale. This is because Hume's evaluation on the role of reason in morality is not even modest. It is actually a downright denial. In other words, Hume thinks in evaluating a character trait of human beings or their action as good or bad, virtuous or vice, morally right or wrong, reason does not play any role whatsoever. Therefore, contrary to the normal moral teaching, which we may hear too much during our daily conversation with each other. That urges human beings to listen to their reason rather than passion. Hume claims that reason, no matter how accurate and true it may sound, cannot play any role in motivating humans' action, and thus it is actually passions, emotions, feelings, and in a word, sentiments, which ultimately constitute the human judgment on moral virtues and vices. Hume's argument for this seemingly very counterintuitive view is relatively easy to understand. He says, "Reason, just as what he has mused in his epistemology, can only achieve two things: it is either about the relationship of ideas following the law of non-contradiction, or about a cause and effect in matters of fact." The reasoning about the relationship between ideas can never motivate humans to act in their moral affairs, because, as explained in his epistemology, ideas are vague copies of impressions. They lack the vivacity and intensity of impressions, such as the raw sentiments of pleasure and pain, and therefore a mere contemplation of the ideas. Can never directly indicate the values of outside objects to human life, and hence motivate human beings to react to these values. This is the reason why the presentation of data, statistics, or mathematical reasoning in general rarely, if not never, motivates us to act morally towards a certain direction. If reasoning is about cause and effect. In matters of fact, considered by itself, this sort of reasoning is just to represent what happens objectively outside of human mind. Since it comprises of representations, this sort of reasoning would be like putting a screen between human mind and the outside world.
In other words, since a mere representation of the outside world does not cause any direct perception of the good or bad of outside objects, reasoning in matters of fact cannot motivate our moral actions either. Instead, Hume thinks that in order for any process of reasoning to have those possessive power to eventually grasp the attention of humans, and thus motivates human to react to circumstances, it needs to be conjoined with another fundamental component of human consciousness, that is the sentiment of pleasure or pain, as well as the triggered passions. Such as pride and shame, love and hatred. Understood in this way, the role played by reasoning in morality is merely twofold. Firstly, if the awareness towards certain objects does cause the feeling of pleasure or pain, reason can help to check whether such objects exist or not, since one function of reason. Would be to represent the objects in the outside world. Secondly, the reasoning of cause and effect on matters of fact can help humans to find the means to fulfill their desires, which are ultimately caused by the sentiment of pleasure or pain in the first hand. In other words, by all counts, it is the sentiment of pleasure or pain. Which helps a human to judge whether any outside object, such as a character trait or human or any action, is morally good or bad, virtuous or vicious. Reason, using Hume's own words, is just the slave of passion, and it can by no means be contrary to passions, since reason alone cannot motivate humans to act. What the normal moral teaching of listening to one's reason rather than passions really conveys, according to Hume, is actually to use one passion to counteract another. This is because only passions can motivate a human's moral judgment and behaviors, whereas reason merely comes afterwards to serve the actions out of passions as an instrument. What is particularly interesting about Hume's thought on the significance of sentiments in morality is that he thought while moral judgment is based upon the sentiment of pleasure or pain, it is not purely out of self-interest that humans evaluate certain deeds as virtuous or vicious. For instance, we can estimate certain character traits of our enemies, such as intelligence. Loyalty or wisdom, as virtuous, even if these virtues are contrary to our self-interest. Therefore, in order to have sentiments play the central role in moral judgment, Hume also thinks our moral consideration needs to be conducted from a general point of view, rather than from a merely selfish perspective. In other words, if we think certain character traits. As being able to bring pleasure and joy to a certain human fellow or others, then they can be judged as virtuous. This also brings us to another very important aspect of Hume's ethical thought: sympathy. According to Hume, it is out of sympathy with the sentiments of human fellows that we ultimately deliver our moral judgment about virtue and vice regarding any potential moral event. In human society, when almost every named philosopher eulogized the triumphant role of reason in the modern era of enlightenment, Hume's skeptical voice towards reason, using such a rigorous argument, is really refreshing. It's not utterly convincing. It points out the limited role of reason in moral affairs, and most importantly, in order to live a good human life. Individuals should pay more attention to cultivating their virtues, which are intimately interconnected with their moral sentiments, than acquiring advanced calculative power of human intelligence. Unfortunately, I do not think even today human fellows have carefully listened to Hume's advice. 
For instance, the educational system from pre-K to higher education is still dominated by a mentality of what I may call intelligence first and character second. In other words, the cultivation of sentiments, emotions, and feelings has not yet occupied a central role in the curriculum of modern educational institution. In this respect, I think philosophers and educators today really need to revive Hume's thought for the sake of the general well-being of human fellows in modern society. However. Although Hume's thought is indeed extremely valuable for reminding us the significance of sentiments and passions for the good of human life, his view that a reason does not play any significant role in morality is also a little bit overstated, since he gives such a narrow definition of reasoning to make it exclusively address the relationship of lifeless ideas. And represents objectively matters of fact, defined as such. Reason indeed has very little power to motivate moral thought and action. However, reasoning can also be about values rather than just about ideas and facts. Per Hume's analysis, the value of things ultimately derives from the sentiments they cause to human beings. However, just as indicated by his analysis of the role of sympathy in triggering our moral sentiments, pleasure has its different kinds, intensity and endurability. According to values of things to human life, based upon such different pleasures, can also be varying. In this sense, we can compare the values of things. Character traits, actions, or even lifestyles and worldviews, so as to reason about them in order to guide our moral reactions to things in the world. In other words, when things in the outside world affect us, our perceptions of them are normally entangled with our value judgment of them, and this value-laden judgment. In turn, can trigger a certain kind of emotions, which eventually motivates us to act. Actually, this identified sequence of stimuli, value-laden perceptions, emotions, and behaviors, is a major tool for today's therapists to envision the significance of philosophy for mental health. Since a philosophical understanding of certain aspects of human life can directly shape. Our perceptions of the outside world, which in turn will rectify certain kinds of self-defeating emotions such as stress, anxiety, or depression, due to our misperception of the value of things in the world. Of course, my critique towards Hume is not a major one, in comparison to his enormous contribution to the discussion about what really matters in morality. Among modern thinkers, in a certain sense, this critique can also be made compatible with Hume's thought, since moral sentiments are indeed a major source for our judgments of values of things in the world. In a word, if we include value as a major target of human reasoning, we can still claim reason plays a significant role in morality. And we indeed need to rely upon the cultivation of specific kind of sentiments, which can be aided by our moral reasoning to live a fulfilled, good human life.